There are currently 195 countries on Earth, and that is a number which is far from set in stone, as the peculiar twists and turns of history constantly give rise to new nations and see the end of old ones. The collapse of the Soviet Union, for example, gave birth to 15 independent nations. For Yugoslavia, it was seven, and for Czechoslovakia, it was two. And every single one of those examples broke up in just the last 35 years or so. Knowing this, then, you probably can't help but wonder what nations might be next on the chopping block. Well, one's no more, because we've trawled through the newspapers to hunt for examples of currently existent nations that look a tad bit precarious. So let's jump in. Hello, everybody. Just before we continue with today's video, have you ever found yourself caught in the age-old dilemma? Boxes too loose, briefs too tight? Well, fret not, because today's sponsor has got your back, or... I guess I shouldn't say your back, I should say your pee. <laughs> your man parts. Look, this is sheath underwear. I'm currently wearing sheath. This is an unworn, nice clean pair because otherwise it would be weird. And this is a game changer. There's no more discomfort, no more awkward adjustments, just pure comfort. If it's a hot day, if it's a cold day, if you're working out, if you're sitting at the office, whatever, Sheath keeps everything in check and just more comfortable. They have this dual pouch system where you put your various pieces. If you want to, you don't have to, but it uh, just separates everything. It makes it less sweaty, less uncomfortable. It's very comfortable. Maybe you're skeptical, maybe you're thinking, I don't know if that's for me. Just get a pair, try it out, you'll see what I mean, you'll like it, and the next thing you know, your underwear drawer is just only sheath like mine. Plus, they've got new designs rolling out all the time, base layers for winter, and even a brand new bamboo women's line. Plus, Sheath are now the official underwear sponsors of the UFC. Head over to sheathunderwear.com and treat yourself. Use the promo code SIDEPROJECTS for an exclusive 20% off. That's sheathunderwear.com, promo code SIDEPROJECTS. Your nether regions will thank you. There's a link below. Don't forget to use the code SIDEPROJECTS for 20% off. And now back to today's video. The first country that may not exist in the future is none other than the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. There stands the very real possibility that in the future, Northern Ireland may break away from the Union and reunify with the Republic of Ireland. The current division of the Islands of Ireland dates back to the 20th century, when, after losing a bloody civil war that raged between the years 1919 and 1921, the British government was forced to relinquish control of the Catholic majority areas in the South while it retained control of those which were majority Protestant in the North, thus creating the current division. Many in the then newly independent Irish Free State, now called the Republic of Ireland, were none too chuffed about this state of affairs, to put it lightly, and they immediately began politically lobbying and militarily fighting to see Ireland united as an independent state free from the control of London. The process proved a difficult one, however, as Northern Ireland was, by and large, staunchly unionist and had the full support of London both politically and militarily. This was all supposedly put to bed by the Good Friday Agreement of 1998, a unilateral political declaration that brought the martial aspect of the disagreement, known as the Troubles, to an end, and de facto also supposedly settled the border dispute politically. For a while, that state of affairs was all fine and dandy. More or less, anyway, there was still the odd bombing and shooting here and there, but largely, the job was done. All of that changed, however, with the Brexit referendum of 2016, which saw the UK vote to leave the EU and stirred up all manner of calamities over the border, chief among them which was the possibility of a hard border forming between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland, which would have been a violation of the Good Friday Agreement and a point of major disapproval from many in both the North and the South. Supposedly, this was all solved by the Northern Ireland Protocol, which was adopted in 2021 and effectively excluded Northern Ireland from the UK's customs border, allowing the open border between the two countries to remain. For some, however, the protocol did not placate their concerns, and now many say that the Brexit vote opened Pandora's box on Irish unification and that it is only a matter of time until the two countries formally merge. Further fueling this is demographic changes within Northern Ireland, as the size of its Catholic population is slowly but surely creeping up, with 2021 census data showing that 42% of the country identified as such, which is up from 40.8% in 2011 and 
40.2% in 2001. Sure, the change is slow, but given the fact that Irish Catholics are more inclined to support reunification and independence on average, one naturally can't help but wonder if the matter of Irish reunification may be on the cards once again. And then there's the matter of Scottish independence, which is a whole other kettle of fish that threatens to tear the UK apart. Scotland itself merged with England and Wales with the 1707 Act of Union, forming the first iteration of the UK as we know it today, the Kingdom of Great Britain. The Scottish National Party, SNP, founded all the way back in 1934, finds the Union rather objectionable. And as a result, it is a party with a single purpose, to secure Scottish independence, and given the fact that it currently holds 63 of 129 seats in the Scottish Parliament and 43 of the 59 Scottish seats in the House of Commons in Westminster, it's fair to say that their platform has plenty of support among the Scottish people. They managed to secure a referendum on the matter back in 2014, which they lost by the skin of their teeth, with it returning a verdict of 44% in favour of independence and 55.3% in favour of the status quo. This seemingly settled the matter. But then, just like with Northern Ireland, the matter of independence was suddenly back on the cards in 2016 thanks to the Brexit referendum, and London has yet to put that particular genie back in its bottle, with the SNP constantly calling for another referendum in the years since, which they have dubbed IndyRef2. Off the back of this, the SNP, in coalition with the Scottish Greens, who also support independence, achieved a majority in the 2021 Scottish Parliament election, the specific results of which we discussed earlier. The coalition interpreted this as a cast-iron mandate for a second referendum. Despite this, the UK government maintained its stance that now is not the time for another referendum, with the Secretary of State for Scotland suggesting that a referendum should only be considered if polls consistently show 60% of Scots in favour of it. Undeterred, Nicola Sturgeon, the former leader of the SNP and First Minister of Scotland, announced plans to hold another referendum on the 19th of October 2023, but this was halted by a UK Supreme Court ruling in November of 2022, which stated that the Scottish Parliament does not have the unilateral power to hold an independence referendum without the consent of the Westminster Parliament. In response to this, as it then found itself with no other option to secure independence, unless it wanted 1776 to commence in the Scottish Highlands, the SNP then shifted its strategy, suggesting that the next UK general election would serve as a de facto referendum on Scottish independence, an election that is currently penned for no later than January 2025. So then, between the lingering perils of Northern Ireland and Scotland, it seems fair to be just a tad sceptical on the UK's ability to survive the 21st century. All right, let's hop over the English Channel now and stop to have a look at Belgium, which stands poised to potentially break apart and collapse in the near future thanks to an independence movement in one of its provinces, specifically Wallonia. So let's begin with some context. Belgium is founded upon an intricate federal structure and is divided into three main regions, Flanders, Wallonia, and the Brussels capital region. This division is not merely administrative, but reflects deep-seated linguistic, cultural, and economic fault lines. Flanders is predominantly Dutch-speaking, while Wallonia is French-speaking, with the Brussels capital region being bilingual, but primarily French-speaking in practice. The quest for Wallonian independence is ultimately a manifestation of these divisions, embodying a struggle for identity, autonomy, and economic revival, which, if realized, would be the end of Belgium as we know it today. With independence, Wallonian separatists seek to preserve and promote their French-speaking identity and culture free from the perceived constraints and compromises that they have had to make within a federalized multicultural system, one which by its very nature has to balance the desires and dignity of a diverse and, as they see it, fundamentally different population. The movement is also fueled by a sense of marginalization and economic disparity. Historically, Wallonia was Belgium's industrial heartland, but as the 20th century progressed, its industries began to decline. This industrial downturn marked the beginning of a shift in economic power towards the more prosperous north, particularly Flanders, which has since experienced robust growth thanks to its modern industries and the port of Antwerp, a critical hub for international trade. This economic disparity is evident in the numbers. For instance, the northern Flemish economy is expected to grow by 1.4% in 2024, with projections indicating further acceleration to 1.7% in 2025. In contrast, Wallonia's growth was forecasted at a slower pace of 0.9% for 2024. 
This economic disparity is further evidenced by the difference in foreign investment trends. In 2022, Flanders attracted 160 foreign investment projects, marking a 13.5% increase from the previous year, while Wallonia saw a sharp decline of more than 40% in foreign investments, receiving only 27 projects, the lowest number in the past decade. Employment rates and labor market dynamics illustrate the economic gap further still. Over 100,000 residents of Wallonia commute to Flanders for work, drawn by Flanders' lower unemployment rate of 3.2% and higher employment rate of 76.7% compared to Wallonia's unemployment rate of 56 and employment rate of 71.9%. This interregional mobility underscores the economic challenges faced by Wallonia. There's, there's basically no one commuting the other way. These economic shifts have contributed to feelings of neglect and marginalization among Wallonians, exacerbating the call for independence. Proponents of Wallonian independence argue that autonomy could allow for policies better suited to addressing Wallonia's specific economic challenges and revitalizing its economy. But is anything going to come of this? Well, with a new federal election on the cards in June of this year, Time is absolutely going to tell. Moldova is a quaint little place tucked away in a little slither of Eastern Europe between Ukraine and Romania. It's a country that's defined by welcoming people, rolling hills and plateaus, a rich cultural heritage, and a lingering sense that it could all end at a moment's notice, courtesy of Transnistria, a semi-autonomous breakaway region that would love nothing more than to hightail its way to independence. Transnistrian independence and its implications for Moldova is a complex issue rooted in historical, cultural, and political factors. The desire for independence in Transnistria, a sliver of land between the Dniester River and Moldova's eastern border with Ukraine, can be traced back to the dissolution of the Soviet Union. As Moldova moved toward independence and leaned towards Romanian cultural and linguistic ties, Transnistria, with its significant Russian and Ukrainian populations, sought to maintain its Soviet-era identity and ties with Russia. This led to a short but intense conflict in 1992, after which Transnistria established a de facto independence, albeit one not recognized by by the international community, including Moldova. Transnistrians, many of whom identify as Russian or Ukrainian, fear cultural erasure through assimilation into a Moldovan state that they perceive as fundamentally Romanian. The region's leadership has leveraged these fears to maintain a distinct identity from Moldova, emphasizing Soviet symbols and the Russian language in public life. Economically, Transnistria has relied heavily on support from Russia, including subsidies and the presence of Russian troops, which has further solidified its separate identity and sparked tensions. The process of Transnistrian independence, or the formal recognition thereof, does face significant hurdles. Internationally, there's little appetite for changing borders, especially in a manner that could be seen as endorsing separatist movements or Russian influence in the post-Soviet space. For Transnistria, full independence or annexation by Russia would require not just a significant shift in international opinion, but also a major re-evaluation of policies by key players, including the European Union, the United States, and Ukraine, alongside Russia and Moldova. Over. In practical terms, however, the prospect of Transnistrian independence, and thus the breakup of Moldova as we know it, hinges on three key factors. Firstly, there is the Moldovan government's stance, as they hold the keys to the kingdom, so to speak. Their support, or lack thereof, will no doubt be a key factor, and given the fact that they have a constitutional commitment to their country's territorial integrity, a commitment that the rest of Moldova is very much in support of, they're unlikely to be waving Transnistria off voluntarily any time soon. And secondly, there's the international factor, i.e. the more foreign nations that support Transnistrian independence, the more likely it is to happen, and on the inverse, the less that support it, the less chance it has. The United Nations has repeatedly affirmed its support for Moldova's territorial integrity, and this reflects the overall attitude of the American bloc of nations, with the European Union repeatedly supporting Moldova's side through various forms of association and partnership agreements. And as for the US itself, well, it was hardly going to be on Team Transnistria, was it? lest they give Russia a major geopolitical win in the form of another sovereign enclave in the interior of Europe. As for the countries on Transnistria's side, even Russia doesn't actually support them officially, even though in real and practical terms, they quite clearly do. Only Abkhazia and South Ossetia officially support independence, and they themselves are both unrecognized splinters of Georgia, so hardly a mighty international coalition. And finally, there is the Russian factor, which is so significant that it deserves further discussion in and of itself 
itself separate from the rest of the international factor. As we've already said, they aren't officially involved with Transnistria, but in reality, all of Transnistria's in vogue politicians have very cordial ties with Russia to such an extent that some would label them a puppet government. Further to this, Russia also maintains an unofficial but very much real military presence in Transnistria, one sufficient enough that in March of 2022, the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe recognized Transnistria as a Russian occupied territory. And frankly, from Russia's perspective, you can get why they are on Transnistria's side. Not only is the territory ethnically Russian, something that a nationalist such as Putin is naturally all about, but it also gives him the opportunity to secure another enclave in Europe, which, given that the continent isn't exactly on good terms with him, by and large, would obviously be a solid win. At the end of the day, Transnistrian independence and the breakup of Moldova comes down to a single question. Will Transnistria's want to be free of Moldova and Russia's wishes to intervene collectively add up to a willpower greater than that which Chisinau and the international community can exert in return? If he asked us that two years ago, we'd have said absolutely hell no. But given everything that's happened since then, we think it would be foolish to completely write off the possibility altogether. For our final chapter today, let's mix things up a bit and look at a country that may well not exist in the future, not due to any political turmoil and instability, but instead due to climate change. The Maldives. An archipelago of more than a thousand islands in the Indian Ocean, the nation is renowned for its extraordinary beauty with white sandy beaches, turquoise waters, and vibrant coral reefs, all accurately being the images that we conjure up in our minds when we think of the nation. But further to these headline characteristics, the geography of the Maldives is defined by another characteristic. It is really, really flat. And that's where the problem comes in. The whole country has an average elevation of just 1.8 meters above sea level. This makes it the lowest lying country in the world by quite a margin, with the next lowest lying country, Qatar, coming in at 28 meters. This makes it kind of seem like Nepal compared to the Maldives. Such a minimal elevation puts the islands at a very real and worryingly immediate risk of being submerged as sea levels rise thanks to climate change. The rates at which the seas are rising, and thus the date at which the Maldives will disappear, is highly disputed. A report published by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change in 2019 projected a global sea level rise of 0.6 to 1.1 meters by 2100 if greenhouse gas emissions remain consistent. They also predict a worst case scenario of 5 meters by 2300 if emissions continue to rise, and 0.3 to 0.6 meters by 2100 if significant emissions cuts are made. By contrast, a survey published in the Climate and Atmospheric Science Journal in 2020 projected a rise of anywhere from between 0.3 and 0.65 meters by 2100 if major cuts to emissions are made, with a rise of between 0.63 and 0.12 meters by the same year if no cuts are made. Furthermore, they also made a worst case prediction of a rise between 1.67 and 5.61 meters if CO2 levels continue to rise. To give a ballpark date, these figures would see the Maldives disappear underwater by the mid 22nd century, give or take. But ultimately, the exact specifics of when it will happen are irrelevant, as the Maldives would appear to be f***ed no matter what happens. Despite the impending doom, however, the Maldives government isn't going out without a fight and is taking bold steps to try and delay the inevitable. But you know the key word there, and that's delay. First among these measures is the development of a pioneering floating city, designed in partnership with the Dutch, who do know a thing or two about bending water to one's geographic whims. The city, which is set to include thousands of waterfront residences across a 200-hectare lagoon near Mali, is due to be complete in the coming decades and is intended to be a climate change-proof city, a city that floats can't be sunk and all of that. But such proposals have their practical limits when the actual Maldives have gone. I mean, what will be the point of a floating city out in the middle of nowhere? And that segues to the next measure the Maldives is taking to fight the rising tide, mass land reclamation as typified by the construction of Hull Hamale, an artificial island intended specifically to sit above the country's average elevation and buy it some more time. The island is currently mid-construction and houses a population of more than 50,000 people, which is due to rise to more or less a quarter million by the late 2020s, and beyond that, even further, as it reaches completion. Ultimately, however, such measures are mere plasters on a wound. There is only so much sand the Maldives government can dump into the ocean, and only so high they can raise their islands. If something isn't done about CO2 emissions now, we will lose this country at some time in the future. 